So a lot of shows I watch on YouTube, like I watch these gurus, quote unquote gurus on YouTube for 45 minutes. And I don't, I don't know what I actually watched at the end of the floor. Like, it's yeah, like, yeah. They, they talk in circles for 45 minutes and then it's like, okay, subscribe to my private YouTube channel yeah, for a premium $900 a month or go to my seminar. So it's like, we're going to give you the straight blueprint of how to be successful. Yeah. Whether you take it or not, it's up to you, but we want to give you all the tools that you need to be successful. So can we talk about as far as, um, like revenue, like how how your revenue model actually works. Yeah, because like, right the thing about it is that, especially in the black community, how I see it, is that entrepreneurs, we have three types of businesses that we always aspire to be, right? Do let's, I say go, let's, let's do the list. Barbershop, hair salon. Mm-hmm. Number one. That's number one, right? And then clothing store. Yep. And then a restaurant. I don't know why, but everybody, it's like everybody's dream to have a restaurant, right? Mm-hmm. And it's one of the hardest businesses to actually be successful in. Like, yeah. I think like 95% of restaurants. And, and we kind of came to the conclusion that it's a status thing. But I, yeah, so your so model is... But yours is actually working. It's working, right? yeah, and so it's so still so. a status thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we're, so, so we're talking about revenue and like how... Yeah. Can you All right, so in the restaurant industry, just specifically in my industry, you have three general costs, which is you have labor costs. You have food costs, and then you have overhead, right? So overhead are the fixed costs, which is the cost of the building, operating expenses, whether it's trash removal, grease removal, uh, gas and electric, your cable, things like that. Those things won't go away. They're fixed, right? And then you have labor costs, which is obviously the cost of having people on staff that can officially execute whatever it is that you want to do. And then you have food costs. Um, so I, I scaled a model in a way in which the profit was already built in. So it was, um, I like to call it winning at the table. So I went at the table. Like, for example, with me, my highest price selling item is a chicken and waffle, but it's the most highly consumed item. Um, a lot of times people who are in the restaurant industry, they tend to sell things because they have an allure to them or they, they look really nice or they think it's going to attract a certain crowd of people, not considering food costs. Mm. Food costs can really sink the ship if you don't really focus on that. My fixed costs and my labor costs are below uh, the industry standard. So, like, say, for example, let's take a chicken and waffle, for example, right? And I say, all right, it takes me $2 to make this chicken and waffle. And I'll ask a young kid, so what are you selling for? They sell $6. Why? Because that's what I thought I should sell it for. Versus, like, if you take me, I'll take the chicken and waffle at 2 bucks, and I know I want my uh, food cost to be 20%, right? So I times it by 5. So I've already won at the table. Yeah. I don't have to make an assumption. But then I might add a $2 margin on it and sell it for $12. Why? Because now you're going to take utensils. You're going to want syrup to go. Yeah. You know, uh, it might be a situation where they might burn your chicken and waffle. And then you got to make another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to win at the table. Um, in my industry, the margin is about 5 to 6% for the owner of what you'll typically make, which you'll typically net. I'm netting them, I mean, 25, 30%. So I'll break the model down. It's real simple. Uh, my fixed cost weekly is $700. Between the supper club and homemade brunch, which grows anywhere from fifteen to twenty grand. My food cost is twenty percent. So let's take the twenty grand, which is the higher number, right? So my food cost is twenty percent. That means that four percent, four thousand goes to food, right? I already told you that my fixed cost was seven hundred, right? Which leaves me roughly at forty seven hundred. That leaves me at fifteen three, right? I run a seven man band. I pay all of them a salary. So all seven people get seven hundred dollars a piece, that's forty nine hundred, right? That leaves me with ten grand. Gross. Mm-hmm. By the time net and all that is extracted, maybe I might walk away with seventy five hundred, maybe eight grand. You know, considering that I got state taxes and I also got my personal income tax. So now, how is it that I'm able to make three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year when we only gross in a million dollars? But in a typical restaurant, for me to make three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, I had to gross five million dollars. Right. It's a winning model. Why? Because my fixed costs are lower. Why? Because my, my food costs have already been priced out, so I made sure I went at the table. And then I put all my employees in, on a salary wage, that way I don't get caught up in hourly and dollars. So it makes sense for us, like, like right now. Blueprint. That's, that's yo, a, I hope notes yo, just take. I don't even think I fully appreciate. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for saying that because a lot of times people, they don't give the blueprint, right? Or they yeah, don't, yeah, they, yeah. They're, they're like stingy with their numbers or they're like, it's, hit, it's hitting secrets. So, I want you to fully appreciate That's just the store too. That don't include the trucks. That's not even including right. the trucks. I want y'all to fully appreciate somebody just coming in and laying it on the table, right? Like I said, we I don't know what else we can do. Like we're trying we're trying to help you out as best way we possibly can, but it's important to have a plan. That's the yeah. thing I like when we spoke on the phone. You have a plan in place, mm-hmm. right? Then another quick piece I will advise people to really focus on too is um 
Play small ball for a while. Don't get so caught up on perception of what people think. So, like, for example, if you were to say, Derek, well, how would you scale your brand if you had no money? Let me give you that, right? So, all right, for example, if I had no money and I had the same food, what I would do is I would do a pop-up and I would do collabs. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Like, say, for example, you guys have a podcast. I'm sure you got to eat eventually. And I would say, well, let me pop up at the podcast, bring some attention to my brain, and I'll make you guys chicken and waffles, right? right. Pop-ups create collabs because now I draw attention to who you are. So the things that you can focus on, which are free, which is your content that you can produce and put out, mm -hmm. right? The image of your brand and the projections and the messages that you convey, and then the relationships that you can create based off of the content that you created, which can allow you to further part of your brand. And that's the reason why I'm here. So now those collabs create situations where now you can generate enough money to maybe not get a restaurant, a brick and mortar, but maybe a full truck, yeah. maybe a car. And then the cart generates flow. You have to understand that flow is data. So all of the customers who come into my restaurant, yeah. I make sure that they're aware that I have a supper club. I make sure that they connect with me through social media. I make sure I got your phone number and I make sure I got your email. So now I'm texting you pictures of the chicken and waffle while you at work all day. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And, I, and I'm creating that flow. There's another concept that we execute from time to time called a brunch and go or brunch pop up, of which I can show pictures of my meals, right? And I can send them out. I can mass text them. You guys can order them through the cash app and then you can come pick them up from my house. Yeah. That's a very effective, very efficient, very clean way in which you don't have any waste. You don't have any overhead. You don't have any labor. It's easy to scale the brand that way. Yeah. That, and that's like one of the things, that, again, that we, we're starting to see the restaurant industry grow to is like these ghost restaurants or these stay at home restaurants yeah. where people are making them based on their orders. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And Chick-fil-A actually just created two fulfillment centers where it's just delivery. So yeah. you order and they just ship it to you. Again, it saves money on food costs because we're only making it when somebody orders it. Yeah. Um, and the data, like you said, that's important. Now the data, yeah, the data. Extremely what did important. you say again? You said data is. You said something. Data is um, information. You said. I said well, I'll say it to say this: Be interested in the people who are interested in you. So, like case in point. You and your wife come into the restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. It's four of you guys. So I've already bought you in. So it's easier for me to sell laterally, which means that now I can collect data from you and say, look, I know you're interested in a brunch. How would you feel about a supper? How would you feel about a wedding? How would you feel about an event? And then grow your business laterally with the people who are coming in. Mm -hmm. I learned that my first store and just being raw and being real that, you know, I thought I had all these great products and I thought that people needed them. So I would go outside to the people who I felt needed them and they weren't interested in them. But you guys are sitting here right now and you want them. Oh, yeah. And it's easier for me to be able to grow my brand. Also, in terms of wealth accumulation, it's always easy to grow laterally so that you can accumulate wealth. What do I mean by that? Meaning like as opposed to me getting seven stores, I could find seven streams in one store. Right. So now you got to realize that I can I can coach. I can consult. I can speak. I got the restaurant. I got the food truck. I got events. I got the brunch and go. That's seven streams of income. The average millionaire got six to seven streams of income. Mm -hmm. I don't need anything else for me to get wealthy. I just need to perfect the things that I'm doing. Perfect your craft. Yeah, you have it right where you are. All right. So, yeah. yeah so, yeah. all right. So, the next topic we're going to go to is scaling your business and taking your business to the next level. All right. So, now you have the um, the back story. You have the current story. But we're going to take it to the next level. So, before I even start, we were kind of debating whether we're going to do the last segment on some other stuff that's in the news right now. It's entertaining, but this is more important, right? This is so, like the blueprint yeah, series. We're going, to, we're going to get back to that next week. We're going to give you some more entertaining stories next week. But this is something that you can actually utilize in your day-to-day -day life and be successful and make some money. So we thought that this would be more important to cover for the last segment. So now we're going to go into how to scale your business, right? Because it's one thing to have a business. It's another thing to have a successful business. And it's another thing to have a successful business that can run without you and can grow into multiple locations and you can actually make some money from because we know that most entrepreneurs aren't really making money. They're struggling, right? Yeah, yeah. So scalability. Yeah. What's your what's your ideas on scalability? All right. So for me it always starts with the end in mind. You know what I mean? So the only way that you can scale is know where you're trying to go. Always related to like if we get out of here right now, we all going somewhere. Whether it's a red light, whether a deer run across the road, whether it's a stop sign, you continue to go. Mm -hmm. A lot of entrepreneurs are just starting. So it's like you start the ignition up to the car and like now you're waiting. 
no one's going to give you direction because we don't have any mentors. Speaking from an African American perspective, yeah, you know what I'm saying? so in terms of the scalability of the brand, you have to have a vision as to how you see opportunity in your industry for you to be able to grow in perpetuity. So it always start for me with my grandkids. So like we say, I don't hustle for my first name, I hustle for my last, right? So like, why why get the trucks? Because the stores, I already told you the store model, right? So the the trucks are for my grandkids. Right. So when it comes to scaling your brand, you have to you have to be focused on a handful of things. You have to have low overhead. You know what I'm saying? You have to know how to grow your brand laterally in a way in which that you can generate multiple streams. Without no more cars. So like, okay, I did the supper club. So let's talk about the supper club. Well, if you look at the supper club menu, right? I got lamb chops, broccolini, and asparagus, right? But it's the same lamb chops that's with eggs and potatoes in the, at the brunch. <laughs> so I'm not selling anything else. If you don't buy that brunch, I'm going to dim the lights down. You're going to buy it tonight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're not going to reinvent this. <laughs> yeah, so you know what I'm saying? It's like we have to understand what it's going to take. So I think low overhead is key. I think uh, bringing in partnerships, creating partnerships is definitely key for black businesses. If you don't create partnerships, the days of being self-employed and sitting in your house doing someone taxes and thinking you're going to be on a Fortune 500 is over with. Yeah, that's a, that's a very so, so Yeah, important. you saw that partnership yeah. collaboration. A lot, a lot of times in our community, we are so hesitant to work with each other because it's like, I want to make it out. I want to make it out. Not knowing that. If we look across, like that person's trying to make a tool. Yeah, together. like I told you, like with the supper club, it's Randy Proble, who's a partner of mine, and Kevin Vaughn. These gentlemen have come on and have, um, endured the stresses of starting up something new, but I've gotten better and better too. So constantly challenging myself. Like when I built out the, the first restaurant, it was six months. The second one was four months. I built out the supper club in 40 days. Mm. I'm talking about we had no menu. We had nothing. We just had a general feel and the message that we want to deliver and we built off of that. So in order for you to scale your brand, it's going to definitely take collaborations, especially if you're black. It's definitely going to take uh, minimal overhead, doing as much sweat equity as you can. To make sure that everything kind of remains intact in terms of financing. But then also coming under the fold of someone who's greater than yourself. Like for me, I'm in a rare space because it's no, it's no black five star restaurants in Baltimore. So I kind of set the standard for what it's to be, but also I have to navigate through a lot of valleys and hills first. Yeah. So like I always equated to like cowboys and Indians where like, you know, the cowboy would look out and all the Indians would shoot him with the bow and arrows. I got to get shot first, yeah. but I'm willing to do that if it provides a, a gateway or a path for you. So it's more specifically when it comes to scaling businesses, I think that you have to have a plan and a way in which you see yourself in that business years from now. So always think about your grandkids and then reverse engineer. So, like, that's what I do when I solve problems in my business. I don't focus on the, the shit that's good. Like, oh, the food is nice and, yeah. you know, the, the decor is nice. But what about the fact that every week when they say they come here, they feel like the lines are too long? Mm. Or, you know, maybe they all want hot syrup with the pancake instead of just, you know, room temperature syrup. So, I think you got to reverse engineer. So, it all goes into how you see it. So, in terms of my business model, we all know I got the real estate piece. So, it's a mixed-use property. It's commercial downstairs. Yeah, can you talk about that? Or let me talk about that. Talk okay, about that. so... It's real simple with my piece. You know what I'm saying? So I have a mixed-use property, right, which means that it's commercial slash residential. There are tenants upstairs. The tenants pay the rent upstairs. And now I have to deal with the rest of it downstairs, which leaves me with a minimal to no overhead because now you have people who've leveraged the cost. So I speak to entrepreneurs who have a brick and mortar. Yeah. Find other ways to use what you already have outside of, instead of going outside of the scope of what you're doing. Yeah, so like that. say if you have a beauty salon and then you can allow someone to double it and use the space as a barbershop. Stop getting so caught up in the thick of really thin things. I call it we major in minor things. So black people, we tend to major in minor things and we make things that are really important. We set them behind the minor thing. Like, what are people going to think of me versus creating wealth? Right. You know what I'm saying? How am I going to be perceived if I rent my space? It's going to be perceived like I don't got money or the business versus, not doing that versus the additional income. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe I might not want to just stuff the uh, the lamb chops with lobster this week to save a dollar. You know what I'm saying? So those things are extremely important. How we look is, is extremely, like, it's a very big thing to us. For, whereas for me, it was like, yo, when I first started my brand, like I told you, I came into the game with 100 grand, right? Yeah. I could have gotten caught up in ego and been like, well, I'm not going to clear this plate or I'm not going to wash these dishes because this is not what count. But I think the division always allows you to surmount. So even when you busting tables, you thinking about I'm gonna have eight locations in ten years. So yeah. what does it matter? Or you thinking about your last name? Think about the long term. Keep the overhead low. Focus on collaborations and get under people who have more knowledge than you. 
No, that's me. I just well, just one minute before you go, Troy, because what you said was very important. And I don't want that to go over people's heads. So you're making money from the tenants upstairs, and that's pretty much covering the cost of the restaurant. So that saves you a lot. Yeah, of- the tenants upstairs cover about roughly sixty percent of the note. So that, that's important to understand because you have to find creative ways to leverage. And that's the scaling model in general. So when people come to me and they say, well, Doc, I think you look great in this strip mall, this shopping center. It don't fit the model. Mm. So the only way I could grow my brand is through mixed use properties that are townhouses or apartments in which I'm at the bottom. That's what that looks like. So now let's, now let's really think about it and break it down. It's no longer a restaurant play. It's a real estate play. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the key.